welcome to the Embodiment Matters podcast with me, Erin Giesemann Rabke, and my beloved Carl Rabke. We don't have the luxury of living in ordinary times, but rather we live in extraordinary ones where the way we live in the next decade will make a huge difference in the future of life on planet Earth. We aspire in this tapestry of rich conversations drawn from a variety of wise perspectives to share resources to help you embody the wisdom, compassion, and skillful actions that are needed during these times. You can find out more about our classes and sign up for our newsletter at embodimentmatters.com. You can also become a supporting member of our podcast with a small monthly donation. Look for Embodiment Matters at patreon.com. Hello, beautiful humans. I am so happy and honored to share with you this truly deep and wide, profound conversation that Carl and I were blessed to have with Pat McCabe, who is also known as Woman Stands Shining. Pat is a Diné mother, grandmother, activist, artist, writer, ceremonial leader, and international speaker and teacher. She is a voice for global peace. She draws upon the indigenous sciences of thriving life to reframe questions about sustainability and balance. She's devoted to supporting the next generations in being functional members of the hoop of life and upholding the honor of being human. My life personally has been so blessed and enriched by reading and listening to Pat over the past many years, and I'm thrilled to share this conversation with you. We cover a lot of territory, deep and wide, including embodiment as a core practice of decolonizing, as well as Pat's trouble with the word decolonizing. We talk about healing Uh, after cultural severance and PTSD through Indian boarding schools and her family history, and the power of growing a multifaceted identity. She speaks to the importance of including the body in prayer, of grappling with the question of how human beings can live in such a way that we can really truly support other life to thrive, as do other members in the web of life. She speaks about how thinking seven generations ahead slows us down in our decision making. And also we look at ways to really prepare ourselves to meet these times. Pat has been asked before and addresses the question again of, is it too late and what should we be doing? And she's got some deeply powerful responses She also talks about her hope for the emergence of the sacred masculine and its role in supporting the sacred feminine to emerge as this hasn't happened yet and uh, how she's banking on these powerful forces to come forth. She also speaks about the need for radical self-love and radical self-trust and of stepping out of the power over paradigm as well as the importance of encouraging the behavior we want to see more of in each other rather than nitpicking each other's imperfections. I hope you enjoy this profound conversation. You may, like us, listen to it more than once and find a really rich harvest. Thanks so much. And you can find more about Pat McCabe at Pat McCabe, P-A-T, M-C-C-A-B-E dot net. And you can also find more information in our show notes on the embodimentmatters.com website. Thanks for listening. Enjoy. So welcome, Pat McCabe, Woman Stand Shining. We are so grateful and honored to uh, be with you today. And um, we're wondering if we could begin by inviting you to introduce yourself Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. Great to see you. Um, So my mama named me Patricia Catherine McCabe, and I come from Diné Nation. As my daughter says, incorrectly known as Navajo. (laughs) (laughs) But we call ourselves Diné. So I'll introduce myself and say, uh, Um, So I'm telling you about my clans. 
that are clans from our mothers. And actually I'm here at my mother's house. Uh, she's 97 and a half. And we've been lockdown buddies and companions for the last little over two years now here. Uh, so I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico right now, but normally I live up north in Northern New Mexico in Taos, New Mexico. And I'll also say that I was adopted into the Lakota spiritual way of life. And in that way, I was given the name Uyakpa Najimi, uh, which translates roughly to womaning, standing, shining. And that's, that's where you find me on this morning here in New Mexico. <laughs> so wonderful to be with you. You know, we often start asking this question, and we'll see if it's interesting to you to, to speak to this about embodiment and what what that means to you and how you relate to embodiment. Mm. Embodiment. Um, well, for me, I'm going to say that's a huge part of decolonization. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't always use that word. It's, um, it's a very loaded word and, uh, and doesn't always move us where I hope to go. But, but just in terms of I'll say modern world paradigm, which is, I always say it's top heavy, <laughs> meaning it's so focused in the intellect. And, um, and so that's been, you know, as I um, have been making my journey back home, the proverbial journey back home, maybe we all are, right? But, um, but for me, culturally, uh, as some of you may have heard in some of my other uh, inter interviews and podcasts, you know, my grandparents and my parents were taken to residential Dutch missionary residential boarding schools. And, um, and so our family had a cultural severing in that process, I would say. Some of our family members know about our culture, but we never practiced it as a family. And I had to go elsewhere to, to find that. And so what I, one of the things I noticed, because, you know, I was raised in the Dutch Christian Reformed Church um, in my early years as a child and, and all the way, actually all the way up until I got sent away from home and then, and then I stopped going, which was quite scary, but I did it. <laughs> and, um, but anyways, uh, so that was, that was what I knew about spiritual life. And, um, and then I left it. And so then there was nothing. Um, but eventually I came to a very, very difficult place in my world. Um, and I sent a call out and I didn't know to what, but what ended up coming back to me was I was invited to my very first um, Lakota sweat lodge ceremony, the Inipi purification ceremony. And um, that was my first native ceremony of any kind that I'd ever been to. And, um, and what I felt immediately was what it was like to include the body in prayer. It was huge. I mean, I, I can't, I, you can't underestimate this enough. It's, it, I mean, it's kind of paradoxical, right? To like seek the spirit and say that one of the most powerful parts about it was, was, was really noticing and being in the body. Um, so to crawl into the sweat lodge, first of all, on my hands and knees and to allow myself to get dirty while, while I was getting ready to pray, you know, which is the opposite of my experience in the church, where we were supposed to stay as clean as possible and ignore our bodies as much as possible, you know, ignore the comfortable clothing you were, the uncomfortable clothing you were supposed to wear, sitting on these wooden pews with nylon lacy tights. That's a special kind of discomfort that not, <laughs> that not, I don't think the boys knew, but the girls knew. <laughs> and, and, uh, and you don't want to have to go to the bathroom. You don't want to, you know, make any sounds, sneezes, coughs, you know, just silence. And, you know, so it's very, very restrictive. So to go crawl into the sweat and to just to actually sweat, um, to feel the resistance of the body and then also to feel the surrender of the body. I think that's part of the power of it. Because I always, you know, as I later began to lead the ceremonies myself, I would tell people it's going to be hot until your mind surrenders. And then when your mind surrenders, you're gonna, it's not going to feel that hot. Because the mind is like troubleshooting. It's like, I don't know, I think we might be in danger here. It's very hot. It's very dark. There's hot stones, there's people all around me. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? <laughs> you know, and then pretty soon all that gets pushed back all the way to the back, silent, subdued, 
um, subdued and 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 brought to a place of um, some kind of innocence and naivete, I would say. And so then, what comes forth is forward is the body and the heart and the spirit, and something really truly powerful happens in that moment where I think we could meet the spirit. So um, that's what I've been thinking about in terms of embodiment lately. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Thank you. I know you've, you've taught quite a bit about just the importance of the feeling body and the, the different pace there is, you know, in a culture where it's so bombarded with facts and information and speed and and what a slowing down is required to really let the intelligence of that feeling body be alive and participating in the world yes and um you know i've also been saying that i feel like humanity is a traumatized species at this point and uh whether you feel like you come from a lineage of being perpetrated against or a lineage of perpetrating. Um, and I think we probably all shared a lot back and forth in our lineages. Mm -hmm. uh, Dene people have some enemies from some things that have happened in the past. Um, so I feel like that's one of the crucial parts about getting back into the feeling body is um, to be able to release, to be able to release um, traumas. You know, we, I think we have such an inherent sense of how things could be if only, and if only, and if only, and if only. And so there's a lot of frustration, I think, built up uh, somatically in the body around this. Um, and so to keep releasing, to keep releasing, you know, we can exercise, that's a huge release, we can go into the sweat, also a huge release, but but part of that release in there is, is to allow all the emotions to come forward, to have a place to do that, to be held while we do that, um, and to invite in new, new patterns, so I say, you know, yes, we're gonna, we're gonna sweat in here, and, and get all dewy, and glowy, and our skin will purify, but really also we're purifying our emotional body by the, by being able to release. And like I say, also for me, I always invite in, you know, I say, take a look at whatever the patterns are that of my emotions that aren't serving because we get in these cycles, we get in these patterns. And, um, and so I'm always asking for them to be interrupted and allow me to, um, well, to, to try try something else for my body, because because I feel like my my frequency is changing. I think everybody's might be at this point, right? Unless you're just really, really, you know, <laughs> bent against it. <laughs> um, but a big part of that is is staying current with the feelings. Yeah. I would love to circle back to something you said in the beginning. And I think you were referring to the word decolonizing. Is that what you were talking about when you said, I don't use that word very often because I don't think it gets us to where we want to go. You want to say any more about that? I'm interested <laughs> to hear if you're open. Yeah. Um, well, so colonization, the making of colonies, the establishment of colonies, um, so, so that is, if we kind of look at it from that more literal sense, um, that was a mindset in which one group of humanity believed it had the right to bring other members of humanity into certain formations and also the land upon which they lived, their quote unquote resources. Um, and, and since uh, these people were not going to do that of their own free will, of their own willingness, then they had to be subdued. Um, however, they were useful. <laughs> so, 
you can't just kill them all because we actually need their labor. So we have to exert other means of, of subduing the life they, they had and that they thought they were going to have and that they thought their children were going to have and, and guide it, form it into what that dominating group of humanity believed they should or could produce for them. So there's colonization, right? Um, on, on kind of on that sense. So all the different ways in which it plays out now in, in, in economic forms, in institutions, in um, et cetera. So, so to say, to use that word is, is to describe a, a profound violence committed human to human. And that is real, that happened, that is still happening. It's not past tense. And, and so I feel like that part of the spectrum of pointing that out is being covered hugely well by many different people. <laughs> so, I want to, I feel like I have a capacity to, and I feel like I'm being led to cover another aspect of that spectrum as we talk about that, which is one, to notice that those that we point to often as being the colonizers also experienced being colonized and brutalized. And I think it's really important for us to, to look at that part you know, and, and maybe you know about some of the work I've done and, and it was described as trying to address what took place during the witch hunts mm -hmm. yeah. in Europe, which was the subduing of indigenous Europe, I would say. Um, so there's that part to notice that longer piece of the history, but then there's also, but there's also for me, a place of wanting to really feel and see and know how this mother earth would tend to to all of us if we understood if we had an interest a deep interest in understanding you know what is her construct about how does she go about her business how does all this life go about its business you know and and it seems to be going about it in an amazing amazingly harmonic har harmonious way mm -hmm. um and so so i want to know how you know my my current inquiry and you know, I'm always working with a certain prayer and right now it's to ask how do I be that human presence that causes all other life to thrive because every other being around me in the natural world every single one the way they conduct their lives their presence is only ever doing that it's only ever supporting all the rest of the life and causing all the rest of the life to thrive mm -hmm. so I have to believe there must be a way for for me to do that, for our kind to do that, for our species to do that. And, and because of the, I mean, in some ways it's overwhelming how, if we really study how deeply interrelated, interconnected we are, how much every single action we make affects everything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And that's why some cultures move very slowly and they think seven generations ahead. They can't just think about their own generation. They, they have to think, how is this going to, how is this decision, how is this feeling even, how is this emotion and where it might lead going to serve because, because everything I do affects everything else. Um, uh, you know, so, so I feel a pretty deep commitment to to understanding how we can open to the truth of this interbeing that we are. And part of that has to do with making that available to each one, no matter what part of history they're linked to, I think. So, so I'm, I mean, it's tricky because we can't just, on the one hand, it's the truth. We are all one. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
but but on the other hand i feel like we have to travel through some of the difficulties still in order for people to truly be able to find peace with looking forward and moving forward together so it's it's a balance it's a mix but i feel like i want to be pulling the spectrum uh in in the direction of of how do we look forward because the mother earth is telling us you can't noodle around in no matter how justified i mean I, i've even gone so far as to say i would i would forego my justice and i got a lot of justice do me as a as a as, as a being female huge justice do me just for being female on this planet i have justice do me for being brown i have justice do me for being elder <laughs> i have justice do me for being dene specifically but I would forgo all of that justice if it meant that we could all turn at this moment and truly ask Mother Earth, what is it that you need from us right now? I'm already going to start crying. <laughs> um, thank you for saying that. Uh, I want to tell you that I have had a Pat McCabe file on my computer desktop where I save some of your quotes that you have posted on Facebook over the years that have like I've really taken deeply and have been so moving to me. And I would love to tell a story of, of one and then another and just have you comment on this because I'm really moved. I'm going to cry <laughs> just by what you just said. And uh, I'll tell the story. So God, I don't even remember. This was some years ago and you were probably speaking to some incredible harm and injustice that was happening to the earth. And I don't even remember the context. And you said, I, <laughs> I speak with the full authority of my connection with Mother Earth, as I'm saying, whatever you said about that. And I felt the power of that, like, you know, through the glowing screen, I was so moved by you speaking from that connection. And then right after that, I had this wave of grief feeling like, you know, oh, I'm a, a white woman living in on Turtle Island. Like, I wish I could have that. And I had so much grief about that. And then, oh, a few months later, you said something like, you need to grow that, <laughs> grow that connection so you can speak from the full authority of your connection with Mother Earth. And again, uh, I was like in tears and so moved. And I was sharing with my friend who I know, you know, Cynthia Jures about that. And she said, yes, deep in that. <laughs> and uh, it's really powerful to take that in and to grow that and to hear from a Diné woman that, you know, uh, it would encourage every one of us to grow and deepen that connection. So I don't know if you want to say anything about that. It's really moving for me. Yes. So we're we're dancing on my one of my most dangerous lines here, but what the heck, you know? So um <laughs> are we? <laughs> yeah, we are, but yeah. it's okay. Uh so uh how could I not want how could I not want every human being to have a relationship with this mother earth at a depth where she actually gets to mother mother you mother you with instruction mother you with with understanding but mother you with beauty mother you with all of your siblings and just think about you know as i'm flipping through my facebook sometimes <laughs> but you know i'm a facebooker um, the things that always get me the most are the, anything about the animals, you know, Facebook knows this. Um, and, and I'm glad, I guess I'm grateful Facebook knows this because I'm always being presented with all this beautiful, but just think about it, the way our heart leaps at the sight of animals, our siblings, you know, how, how could I not want that for every single human being? How, how, how would, how could I want to be part of the withholding of what the Mother Earth would give to her child to live in 
in harmony and to live in beauty. I, so this is the difficulty for me about, about the uproar about appropriation. Um, it's, it's complicated and yet it's not complicated <laughs> in some ways to me. Um, things can be misused and there's a lot of hurt in, in our history. Um, I just had an elder talking to, to a group that I'm working with and, and said something so radical that, that the past would prevent us from being who we came here to be if we allow it. I don't know if that's coming across the, the new way it's hitting me right now, but it's, and, and there are people who want to hold you back from other ways of knowing so that you can remain in a certain identity. And sometimes that identity is hugely based on past historic and traumatic events. And, um, and so, you know, who are these people and why would they want that for you? Um, that's a question, a dangerous question I'm entertaining right now. <laughs> 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 because it's very culturally instilled in me, you know, we must never forget and we must always remind and we must, you know, but, but I, I have to take some breaths out of it just for my own survival. I mean, I suffer from PTSD. I mean, I, 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 I talk in, in ways that maybe bring help and comfort because spirit has helps me to do that. But that is not to say that I don't go through a lot in order to keep showing up for this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, um, I, I have PTSD and I, I have suffered from the fallout of attempted genocide. Um, and I'm watching my children, you know, I'm watching what I couldn't prevent from passing on, how that's playing out and that's heartbreaking. Um, so it's not to say that I have such a blessed and charmed life that I can't understand anger, the anger or the pain or the fear. <laughs> I do. <clears throat> and, um, but I have to, so I, so I have to allow myself to think outside of that identity of the trauma and spirit always encourages this spirit is forever you know i was having actually a talk with my son last night and um because he's doing a lot of healing work i'm so proud of him i'm so proud of him he's 25 and he's like man we got you got we got to heal some stuff i got to heal some stuff i'm like yeah all right <laughs> <laughs> and um and so we we talk about our healing process but i was telling him that you know <clears throat> I there's like what it's, I think it's called the ACE score or something. It's like adverse childhood event mm -hmm. scale, and the, the, there's the, it goes from like one to ten. I think I'm like either an eight or a nine on it or something. Mm. And uh, I don't think I witnessed anybody being murdered in front of me. I think that's the only one. But um, but I was telling him, you know, there was that, and the, there's all this damning evidence about why I should probably just curl up in a ball and shrivel up and, and, and not move or something, you know, and, and even the circumstances of, of my mom carrying me in utero. Um, so all of that evidence is, is lined up, you know, the intellect has made its airtight case for why, why I should just be a traumatized mess all the time. But then here comes spirit and spirit says, Actually, the truth, that is, that is one version of truth, but there's another truth that's also there that I want you to know about. And that is that the whole time you were in your mother's belly, she was gestating a baby star jaguar. A baby star jaguar. And that baby star jaguar was completely oblivious to all of the events on earth and with your mother and with everything. <laughs> like, like impervious to it as well. And all this star baby star Jaguar was doing was 
remaining connected to the cosmos, praying and waiting for the moment when it would leap out, when she would leap out into the world and bring what she came here to bring. So that's also true. And, um, and I think um, that, you know, I'm just constantly moving between <laughs> those two things. But to go back to your question, you know, uh, I want, I want to see every human being have spirit talk to them like that. I want to see every human being have the Mother Earth talk to them and guide them mm -hmm. into really being able to see and then participate in how magical and mysterious this life is that we've been given. It's not the life of the intellect. It's not the life of the power over paradigm. I love that meme that says, you know, we, the spirits tell me, you guys could have it any way you want it, any way you want it. Right now you're saying you want it like this, but remember you could have it any way you want it. So I saw this meme that says, so of all the possibilities, we choose white supremacy and credit scores. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we, and, and too many of us believe that's, where we've been placed mm -hmm. and I would just love to see us bust out of that and find out who we could be instead mm -hmm. yeah those that just to see how pervasive and that many humans have known nothing other than being steeped in the power over paradigm and yet I love how you bring this in our heart of hearts we all know that there's a potential world where the thriving of all life could be supported like underneath that something is is still there that knows that potential yeah that's what our time off is about right it's actually time off from that lie <laughs> and where we go <laughs> into a place of a sense of relief and well-being and recharge and then we and then we go back to it <laughs> and then we take time off from it it's kind of crazy yeah I'm struck by, you know, as you're speaking so beautifully about what you want for human beings to in being able to have that kind of connection. I'm curious about, you know, and in the conversation about appropriation and dancing on the dangerous <laughs> edge or whatever, about manners, you know, like also what not just us being sort of funded by Mother Earth by growing that connection, but how to learn manners that white supremacy culture is clueless about you know do you, does that inspire anything for you i think about this a lot <laughs> i like that word manners yeah. um, manners well so just like with a child i mean we are children really uh but with a very young child so you can you can train them to be uh, to go through the motions of having manners. And to some degree, I think that's necessary uh, in order if you if if that's a, a, a big priority for you, which it was for me. Um, but but what really is the powerful thing is when it's coming from the inside out, right? Mm -hmm. Not from the outside in, not for how it looks. What do people think? I love Wanda Sykes, the comedian, African-American comedian. <laughs> She's talking about people, her mom saying to her, white people are watching you. What do you think you're doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So we have all different kinds of reasons for wanting our children to have manners. <laughs> um, but I think what you're talking about is towards the earth and towards each other. And, um, you know, what I say, because I have had the terrifying and also amazing experience of working with 15 and 16 year olds um, for some years. Uh, and I bring them to some really special places in northern New Mexico. 
And, uh, and so there I have a short, short period of time to try to orient them in some kind of way where I'm not going to regret where I'm bringing them. <laughs> One of them is down to the river. That's a little easier to manage, although for me, it's very important. I, it hurts my heart when there's no manners going on there. Um, but then I also bring them to Taos Pueblo, which is one of the most conservative, strict indigenous communities that I'm aware of on the planet. And, um, and, and so, you know, for me, well, one, I, I tell them about tobacco. I give them tobacco as we are on the bus and they're like ready to go and, and do cannonballs in the river. They're just like waiting to be released from that bus. And I'm like, oh my God. And, uh, and so, um, <clears throat> so, I, so I always present them with this possibility of using tobacco. And I tell them this tobacco, you know, because I've already been talking to them a little bit about what I've, some of the things I've said here. And I tell them that the tobacco is this plant relative and it agreed to help us because we need help, because we don't have manners, <laughs> because we, <laughs> we don't understand the situation where we're, and our minds are so prone to doing all this stuff that will lead us in any direction if we don't understand where, who we are, where we are, how it is. So the tobacco says, I can help these, these unruly kids and, and help like sort of, I call it combing out the mind to some kind of order. What kind of order? Not human order, not order of, not pecking order, not hierarchical order, but the order of harmonizing with earth and with the life around us, right? And so, so the tobacco agrees to do this. And tobacco, I said, so if you like how I'm speaking, I want to point out that, that I've been taught to hold this tobacco and express myself. And so this tobacco is actually giving me language, a kind of language that has, I guess we could say those manners, that has respect that has reverence in it and so I can't take credit for my language people tell me they like my language well that has to do with with standing in front of the fire and holding tobacco in front of my elders and having them tell me to speak and um and letting that tobacco work on me to say the right to say not the right thing but to say the to say the things that are true from the heart and um that that, that all of our hearts can respond to and so I tell them about that and I said so the other thing we do is if we approach a place with tobacco, that is a sign that places recognize, they recognize this gesture from us. And so if we go and we do that, then the place is going to take notice because the place is used to people coming and just doing whatever the heck they think of to do. But, but if you pause and offer tobacco, and I tell them, and, and it's a good thing to offer tobacco here at the river because this water is what's been keeping you alive. And also your hosts and all the animals around long before you got here. So, you know, you're partaking of what of the life force that keeps everything going here. So it's good to honor that. And so if we offer that tobacco, we're showing respect. So that's and, and if we show that respect, the place is going to respond to you differently than it would have if had you not done that. Now, if you can also then bring yourself to reverence, like, look at this place. I mean, I bring them to this spectacular spot on the Rio Grande, right? I'm like, look at this place, you know? I mean, we could see eagles flying over at any moment. Blue herons, you know, tearing down the, the Rio Grande corridor, the fish leaping out of the water, uh, the, the, what do we call those ones? The swallows playing with us. They'll play with us. They're still playful. Um, any of these things could happen at any time. Bighorn sheep can come down for a drink. Um, so, so yeah, if you can muster reverence as you lay down this tobacco and acknowledge who you are in relation to the water and to all the life around you, watch what happens. And then I tell them, but you don't have to. <laughs> but I'm just saying this is a possibility. So as they're getting off the bus, I hold out my tobacco and if they feel like it, they take it. And I just watch, you know, what happens to them. And then I watch what happens to the place and how the place responds. So that's sort of a, a, a long winded way of talking about, you know, that manners gets generated out of out of our hearts and out of 
a, again, a sense, a different sense of who we are, where we are, how it is, with, with a, a different sense of earth is not resource. Um, and, and so hopefully, you know, our actions then become, become motivated by our, by our awe. Mm. If we really understood where we were, manners would not be an issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But we've been talked out of seeing where we are. Yeah, it, it, it takes me back to what we started with around embodiment of the way we embody ourselves when we really hold our surroundings with reverence and care. It's it's just a completely different way of breathing and seeing and hearing and interacting with a living world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And so once, you know, there's such a softening that happens that I notice, you know, and when we've taken young people, high school students, college students to go visit with my grandfather, my, my clan grandfather, who's now traveled on, um, <laughs> this phenomenon would happen every time and where people, the, the kids would start giving away stuff to each other, mm -hmm. giving their shirts away, giving their jewelry away. And my clan grandfather would always say, well, you know, it's working when they start giving stuff away. <laughs> like that's the natural arising of opening to the truth of the beauty of where we are. Yeah, it reminds me of that line from Rumi, awe is the salve that will heal our eyes. You know, I love, I love how it's rooted in that. Yeah. Um, can I read you something that you wrote that is in my <laughs> Pat McCabe file? <laughs> that I return to that I love so much. <laughs> and then you can comment on this if you'd like. Uh, dear family, prepare your hearts, prepare your courage, prepare your children and loved ones too for your deep commitment to unity and life. Do what makes you strong and fierce about love and peace. You're going to be called upon to stand up, stand out. You may have to be the first one to step out. You may have to be the witness to the first and you'll have to be the second. Get ready mentally, emotionally, create a support system too to hold you, you personally, during and after you stand in the fire of peacemaking. Prepare your local authorities too. <laughs> The sacred hoop of life doesn't understand us and them. The sacred hoop of life only understands we. Let us prepare ourselves for full participation at last in this law of life. Thank you for those words. <laughs> they make me cry. Yeah, they're making me cry too. They're making me cry because uh, that's spirit. That's not me. It's me and spirit, but uh, it's mostly spirit. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's reminding me of times when I've been in that level of relationship and feeling that level of strength standing with spirit. And I have to say, I'm struggling with that today. Um, and so I've been having to, well, it's been a very humbling time, this pandemic, um, for probably maybe everybody, but, but for me too, um, I, I don't, and I'm also being caregiver to my mom, uh, for, it's only, it's only been a little over two years, but oof, it's, it's deep. And I don't get to live in my home. I, I'm living in a very urban place. And I, um, you know, I, I talked a little bit earlier about, you know, that I have PTSD and, and I have to work with trauma stuff. So I've, I've learned how to build the place that can sustain me through that. Um, as a friend of mine pointed out, uh, and I'm like, wow, but on the, one, on the one hand, you're not there. 
<laughs> and you're experiencing the difficulties with that. But on the other hand, notice what you did do. Like you figured out to do kind of what is what you just read. You know, I have my support system. I have my healers. I have my deviners. I have my places on the earth that I go for different things. Um, I recharge. My, my home is sanctuary. I prayed a lot about my home being sanctuary. Mm. And it's actually kind of like one big altar. <laughs> There's just altars everywhere in there. They just keep growing, <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> and, uh, um and i don't i don't have that here there's some there's something about you know my parents culture of this house and part of me wants to just take it over completely <laughs> right and just like here's how we're going to do it but i don't I, I i have some respect for how my mom is and, and that there's that colonization that's what happened there and so you know she fortunately is content to leave me with my few spots in here my weird little world um so so yeah those building that space is so important it's so important and then i i really do appreciate this time though of being humbled and sort of being torn out of my ceremony in, in many ways um many people have been because they don't want to come together um, with the virus especially as we're losing some some of our elders and our knowledge keepers language speakers deep deep language speakers etc um, having to be very careful but it's reminding me of what my what my ancestors went through when our ways were declared illegal all the way up until what 1972 or 78 somewhere around in there you know and I just thought, wow, what must that have been like, especially with all the trauma that was raining down upon them, you know, the horror that they were subjected to. I mean, attempted genocide is pretty serious. And, and then to be kept apart from your ceremonies. Um, that was, that was pretty heavy. And I feel that today. And I also say, and, and they did it. It wasn't easy. It didn't come out intact necessarily, but it but but they did it so so i'm having to remake remake my sanctuaries remake my support and um and part of it has to do with with vulner vulnerability and intimacy all new levels of vulnerability in intimacy um and it's via zoom often and it's via, it's via um other modalities. Um, so I don't know, that's what came up for me when, when you read that just now. Mm -hmm. I know one thing we talk about quite frequently is, is just the, the urgency of these times. And as our, our friend bio often says, these times are urgent, we, we must slow down. And, and I've noticed this summer, especially with pandemic and with the, the fires and smoke out out west that that many people are having some of the veils removed around how how urgent and how dire these times are with extinction and all that's going on and i'm wondering if you could speak to uh you know what what guidance would you offer people in how to approach the the urgency of these times um, you know, I was at, I was in Devon, England, and um, I was doing a little live Facebook thing with uh, some folks at the community of Embercombe. And, um, <laughs> and I'll never forget this young person. So there was three of us there, and we were doing uh, sort of talking about indigenous ways, and it was a woman from Wales. and and um, a man who was raised uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, uh, but he was Scottish, and then myself. And anyway, so this question could have gone to, well, it did go to any of us. And this young person just flat out asked, so is it, is it too late and what should we be doing? <laughs> and I'm like, oh, there's an easy one. <clears throat> and so they all look at me, they're like, why don't you take that one? <laughs> <laughs> So I felt like a deer in the headlights. And, um, but, but what came to me to say, 
and I and it came just now when you asked a, little bit, a similar thing question is um, I think all possibilities are still humming in the air. I ask, um, you know, I'm I'm still I'm still banking heavily on the rise of the sacred masculine coming through. Mm. That is one huge untapped resource, medicine. I mean, I don't know if I like that language, but you know, it's that has not appeared among us for a long, long time. And there's a lot of work being done around that right now. Mm -hmm. But what happens? What happens when the men understand that they are not power over paradigm, aka patriarchy? and understand who they are as sacred masculine and begin to enact that fully that respect and reverence for life and for earth <clears throat> and i i wrote this piece recently about this and i said so when that happens one one thing that's one domino effect is going to be that the sacred feminine eros is going to be released because it can't, it can't be released right now. There's, it's not safe enough. There's no container for it. But that feminine eros is powerful, powerful stuff. It's powerful creation. The womb of the woman is connected to the womb of the cosmos. This is what Ilarian Merkulif, um, Alu Elder, talks about frequently. And nothing new is going to appear on this earth until it so the woman makes that connection and, and until it comes through that doorway. But I think part of that has to, before that happens, it has to be the full expansion of her eros. Mm. And so, so there's that part of it. But the other part of it is that what's gonna, what would happen for the Mother Earth? Who would the Mother Earth be? How could she respond? How could she unfurl? if she felt safe mm. she doesn't have the safety to be everything that she is so if i'm synonymous with life if i'm synonymous with earth then i'm looking at that equation right there so <clears throat> so there's there's that so so all possibilities are humming in the air that's just one aspect of the possibilities that we have yet to see play out we don't we we keep forcing the mother earth to be like this inanimate inanimate kind of clod that we act upon we don't understand that she has the ability to respond to us but but what we can we can create that circumstance and and also um the other piece that came up when that student asked me that question was we have to trust ourselves. We have to have radical self-love and radical self-trust mm -hmm. because all of our identities have been, too much of our identity has been formed in relation to institutes and human constructs that were not made with, with the understanding that we have to place life at the center. So, so somehow we have to keep abandoning and shedding those, that part, of our identity and step into um, a, a more fundamental, um, primal understanding of ourselves that, that is responding primally, spiritually and emotionally and mentally in, in a different way. And that, that means we have to trust. So again, who am I looking to to tell me how I'm supposed to think and act and feel and why am i doing that it, so much of it is related to past events so um so that's a, that's happy news really to to step into radical self-love and radical self-trust as a as a response to the urgency and and this time we have to be able to receive new information and we cannot receive it through the power over paradigm mind you know, I, I just in the last week attended 
a digital town hall. I don't usually show up for things like that, but it was about uh, our great Salt Lake. We live in Salt Lake City and the Salt Lake is uh, near dying. Um, it's a huge ecosystem that supports 10 million plus migratory birds and it's beautiful. Um, and there have been, you know, we're also in drought and climate change, but there's been a lot of human unconscious water diversions from the, you know, rivers that usually feed into the lake that are diverted for green lawns in the high desert. You know, it's kind of crazy. And I showed up at this event. I'm grateful it happened. These are, you know, a politician and experts in water and air quality and all this stuff. And um, they care, and I'm grateful they're paying attention to it. And I was a little bit astonished by, I'm just gonna say it, like the stupidity of Western mind and the power over paradigm. Like they're all, as is, thank goodness there's gonna be negative economic impacts if the lake dies because otherwise I don't think they would care, you know, it's, um, and I guess I, I try to read and hang out with and steep myself enough and people like you who are, you know, rooted in what just seems like common sense to me, but I was really astonished, like, that no one was thinking like this, um, reverence or just even letting the lake be herself or <laughs> everything we're talking about. Um, I'm so, I get so inspired and lit up by what you're saying, Pat. And, you know, I refer to your words in my Pat McCabe file <laughs> frequently and, um, and wow, there's a lot tipping the scales in the direction of this other way of being on earth. And I don't know, I'm just feeling that right now. Yeah, uh, my inspiration to hear what you're saying and like, whoa, most people, I guess most people, um, a lot of people, many people who are in positions of power uh, aren't thinking like this and could really use some, some education, <laughs> some humility and some education in this way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess that's what came up for me when you were talking about radical self-trust and uh and even you know joking about your weird little world in your <laughs> in your mom's <laughs> space you know like the willingness to practice radical self-trust even when we're weird in this greater system that is uh not tuned to systems thinking and stuck in a power over paradigm and all of that indeed <clears throat> i had a heartbreak this week around line three you know, it's like, no, we're going to start. I think today, actually, they're want to start pumping the oil through. And we already know that there's breaks all through it. We're already seeing the evidence of it. <laughs> and it's going right through all that water. <sighs> yeah, it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and so I, um, you know, at the same time as I'm talking about radical self-love and radical self-trust, I don't think that that means that I, that I stand by and watch. I, I, I have to be involved in the water situation in Taos. My son is definitely, um, looking at that and, and being vocal and bringing community together around that. Um, and I just feel like we, we're, we are in for some pretty big devastating losses that, that we are going to have front row seats for. And, you know, I remember telling these 15 and 16 year olds, I used to say to them, you've got to want your life. You've got to want your life. You've got to want it like this, you know, you've got to want it. Whatever it is that makes you want your life, go there. Mm -hmm. I was telling them. Uh, and if it's school, great. And if it's not school, pay attention, follow that. 
because you're going to need that. You're going to need to want your life for what's coming. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I have to follow that advice myself, you know, um, now it's a little tricky where I am, but I'm working on it. Uh, you know, like we have to keep stoking that flame of what makes us want this life, what brings us, because there's going to be some rough stuff coming for sure. And, um, and, and there's also going to be an enormous amount of willingness. So this is, this is what's difficult about, for me, about this call out culture that we're in is anytime somebody begins to shift their perspective and try to express that, what happens, right? They get jumped. Oh, why were, now you're saying that, oh, well, why didn't, you know, I mean, it's like snotty and nasty and, and inhibiting. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know, you know how it is. We encourage the behavior we want to see. <laughs> like that, That's how you get more of it. You don't get more yeah. of it by shooting arrows at it and spitting on it and stomping on it and poisoning it. You, you know, it's like pretty basic psychology. And so, so I just, I say, I've been saying to activists for some time now, and now I'm really feeling it is like, contrary to, I guess it was what Einstein said, you cannot simultaneously pre pre prevent and prepare for war. I'm like, we have to, we have to do both. We still have to stand for what we need to stand for. And if, if with our bodies, if necessary, and say, I do not consent to this destruction. Mm -hmm. And we also have to be prepared to receive this wave of willingness, you know, mm. because, I mean, I think about Greece right now on fire. I think about, you know, what, what happened in Louisiana with the hurricane. Like, there's no amount of money in the world that can give those people their life back. Mm -hmm. It just cannot be bought. And so... We are coming to that time, as Chief Seattle said, you know, one day they're going to realize they can't eat money. Well, that day is coming. So, you know, all that money that you've hoarded, it's going to be worthless. So now mm -hmm. is actually the time to begin to consider what should I be doing with this? It really, it's damned up life that has been hoarded and kept apart from the life system. So that's actually what it is because it's all been extracted it's been extracting from what it's been extracting from life itself so mm -hmm. now that the earth is going through what she's going through now is the time to release that dam and let that life flow and it looks like money that mm -hmm. has to happen and i would do it sooner rather than later because what, what are you going to do when the earth is dying and you have all your zeros in your bank account and you could have done something and you sat on it because you couldn't accept the reality of what was coming. Mm -hmm. Can't eat money. I hope there are some people listening who have some zeros in their accounts who take this to heart. <laughs> I wish we were them. <laughs> well, I'm meeting with, with many of them now and that is heartening. So to just to know that there are people who are looking at this very seriously and, and they're calling together all different groups of people who've never sat in the same room together and said, what do we think? So that's mm -hmm. happening. That is happening. That's hurt. Yeah. And, and again, the, the sense of we've never imagined the possibility if all of those resources were going toward a sustainable, reverent life, if, mm -hmm. if, it, if it weren't going to extraction and power over and dominance, if it were going toward thriving, like who knows what those possibilities could be for life on this planet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think I think with these groups that are meeting, um, I've been I've been in that's like been my obsession for the last two years. A lot of people don't know that about me, but I've been meeting with wealth holders and and people who've been involved in finance and wanting desperately wanting to change the financial system, as they say, money is upstream of every problem we have. Because you know, and so the same elder that was talking about, you know, how the past would prevent us from becoming what we came here to be. Um, he says, you know, money is the largest, deepest, longest running unconscious agreement that humanity has ever made. 
So one, we, we can be bringing to consciousness what that unconscious agreement has been. And, and, and guess what? Me as a quote, non-wealth holder in that sense, I have a role in keeping that unconscious agreement intact. So I have to dismantle my part as, as the oppressed, economically oppressed person living in fabulous, abundant, fearless generosity, radical abundance, Mother Earth. I have to do my part to change that agreement as well. But, um, <clears throat> but, but one thing that I think he's kind of a hard guy to hold on to everything he says, um, but it, it's more like moving through your body. So I can't ever quote him, but he said this thing that made, made this come into my mind, which is basically that money is already in everything. It's in every dang thing. And so if we were to rather, yeah, cause my, my move would be, let's just get rid of money altogether. And that would force us to have to look at what actually sustains us, which is the earth. But this other idea has been coming lately, which is, but what if we changed our agreement about what money was? It's already in everything. So it actually has the power to transform everything all at once if our consciousness were to change about it. So i um, been working on that level as well. But I do feel like, you know, with the work that we've been trying to do that and, and, and giving a space for people who have those kinds of resources to be held, to understand themselves. Because whether you have a lot of money or you have little money, the worst thing you can do with it, right, is be foolish with it. We must never be foolish with money. Never, ever, ever. Cardinal rule, right? So, so, so part of the process is to line up that logic, not only the logic of the mind, but the logic of the heart and the spirit and hold it together and create a space for those bold moves to start to happen. And I think once those bold moves begin to happen and they already are happening, but they're gonna get deeper and there's going to be a domino effect of, of other wealth holders saying, wow, well, that person was willing to do it. I'm willing to do it too. So it's happening. And I think it's gonna keep happening. So there's another um, long shot that is humming in the air for what could change many things. Yeah, perhaps instead of launching space rockets. <laughs> <laughs> well, though, that has served to point out some very important things, I will say. <laughs> I know we could sit here and talk to you for hours and hours, and I would love nothing more than to do that, but I'm conscious of your time, Pat. How would you like to close? How are you inspired to leave us and leave listeners? Well, my clan... Grandmother said that thing that I've repeated many times, which is you were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. That's the truth. You were born into beauty as beauty for joyful life. That's the truth. And so I guess I would just encourage us to um, consider where, where are we at with, those, with that statement? <laughs> How close are we to it? How far away are we from it? And you know so that's a part of my process right now is i'm having to i can't dig any deeper i've i've been digging deep and digging deep and digging deep i can't dig any deeper so now i have to make some other kinds of changes in order to be able to align with that statement and um part of that just has to do with you know taking elder care that's that's pretty uh, uh, it's extractive <laughs> for anybody and, and and in the isolation of pandemic it's particularly difficult um so yeah, I'm having to realign. So, so I encourage us to to know, like, what if what if that's a north star that we can know is the truth? And then I say, how far away am I from really knowing that truth in my body, in my mind, in my heart, in my spirit, and and living from that place? So maybe I'll leave us with that. Mm, mm. It's so rich, beautiful place to leave us. I just want to say it's a dream come true to talk with you. So thank you so much for making time to be with us. Yeah, thank you so much for just who you are and what you call out to in this world. It's, hmm, thank it's you. It's really an honor to be with you. It's an mm -hmm. honor to be here. And I'm happy that we got to have this time. Thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. 
Uh, if you enjoy this podcast, it's great if you want to share it with friends or post about it on social media. Also, you could make a donation to support the podcast or find out more information about our classes and offerings at our website, embodimentmatters.com. Mm-hmm.